Breaking news, Project Veritas is suing the New York Times for defamation over its reported coverage of Project Veritas's videos on ballot harvesting and voter fraud in Minnesota. Let's talk about it. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Law Explaining the Interwebs. I am your host, Nick Ricada of Ricada Law, a small law firm in central Minnesota. And today we're talking about a story that touches a little close to home in Minnesota, but tangentially through Project Veritas. Now, I did a video on this a little while back, and you can go check it out. It is about Project Veritas's video about ballot harvesting and alleged voter intimidation and fraud in Minnesota coming primarily from Ilhan Omar and also a uh, Democrat city councilman in Minneapolis, particularly in the Somalian districts of Minneapolis. All right, so the allegations in the video were pretty straightforward. They in, uh, they interviewed someone who had uh, alleged that Ilhan Omar and the city councilman were engaged in illegal ballot harvesting and voter intimidation and voter fraud. All right. So they alleged that and they also they also relied on video from a guy named Jamal who is going around doing the ballot harvesting. Uh, the videos Jamal posted to his own social media were talking about receiving money for uh, for absentee ballots and collecting large amounts of ballots. Now, in Minnesota, it is unlawful for a person to assist with delivery or completion of more than three ballots. And this is something that is a little bit nuanced, as we'll get into in just a minute with the article, uh, because it's illegal, but that law is not currently being enforced due to a court order. However, does that make it not illegal? No. No. So anyway, let's get into this. Project Veritas has an article up on their webpage. I will post the link in the description. I encourage you to check it out. Um, I will also go through part of the article, but it's a long one. We're not going to go through the whole thing, okay? So here we go. Project Veritas sues the New York Times for defamation over labeling our videos deceptives. Uh, coordinated disinformation using solely unidentified sources and no verifiable evidence. All right. First big hurdle. They're suing the New York Times and they are uh, similarly a news publication. So they are definitely public. They're public figures. This is clearly a matter of public concern. So they are going to be subject to the heightened standards uh, for defamation, which is not only do they have to prove that, uh, that the New York Times published a false statement which caused them damage. And uh, they, they also have to prove that the New York Times published that statement knowing that it was false or with reckless disregard for the truth. This is called the actual malice standard. So they will have to go ahead and prove that out. Now, they are suing in New York, which does not have an effective anti-slap statute. So uh, there will not be a simple uh, anti-slap uh, knockdown of this case. They will have to attempt other means of dismissing the lawsuit. But, um, but they will still have to prove those elements. Now, the first hurdle that they've got is proving that the New York Times indeed published a false statement of fact rather than an opinion. All right. So uh, deceptive, coordinated disinformation, uh, unidentified sources and no verifiable evidence. Well, um, at least three of those, at least three of those uh, can very reasonably be categorized as opinion statements, deceptive, coordinated disinformation, and no verifiable evidence. It doesn't mean that they necessarily are or will be, but a strong argument could be made that those are uh, opinion statements and not statements of fact. Now, using solely unidentified sources is a fact statement 
and it's verifiably false because there are identified sources in the Project Veritas videos. So that's a little bit, uh, that's a sticking point for them. The next hurdle they'll have is um, proving that those statements impact the overall thrust of the article enough for the entire publication to be defamatory. So if you just say one line about someone and it's false, that's pretty easy. That is your publication. Uh, that is your statement. And therefore, if it's false, then it's false. Very simple. A news story is a little bit different. And in this case, it's a thousand word uh, news story written about the Project Veritas videos. And so when courts look at this, they don't just pull statements out of context and look at them in isolation. Was this false? Was this false? Was this false? No, they, they actually look at the the entire published work as a whole, and they determine if the gist of the work is false and defamatory. This allows news uh, publications mainly to get a couple of facts wrong, but have the overall thrust of the article be right. It also allows plaintiffs like Project Veritas the opportunity to say, look, they said a bunch of factual things, but the way they organized them in the, thi in the, in the paper, the way they present it, what they left out, it was intended to create a false sense about the uh, in the publication. The work as a whole is false, even if the component parts are true. So it kind of goes both ways. But in this case, it is going to be a hurdle for Project Veritas as they're alleging false statements of fact being said. And New York Times will have part of a defense built around the idea that uh, even if these are inaccurate, the overall thrust of their story is true. Again, according to the New York Times, not according to me. Um, I, I don't know. I haven't read the New York Times article. It's not really important at this point uh, because here's the case that Project Veritas is making. All right. Now, I also don't know that they've actually sued the New York Times uh, because they said that they had until October 2nd. Oh, wait, yeah, so October 2nd. My brain broke. I thought it said November 2nd. Let's just go through the article. So James O'Keefe, uh, quote, The Times made this false claim saying our story relied solely on unidentified sources. This is absolute hogwash, dishonest, and libelous. Uh, another quote from O'Keefe, the second word of the article about our, min uh, about our Minnesota ballot harvesting investigation calls the video deceptive, but there is nothing in the article to substantiate this libelous claim. Again, this one's a little bit tough. Project Veritas lawyer says the New York Times reporters Maggie Astor and Tiffany Sue violated their paper's own code of conduct. New York Times lawyer says alleged errors, however, are either immaterial or not errors. They are disagreements with the author's conclusions and opinions. Now, part of the uh, argument for the Project Veritas piece here is this, this isn't published as an opinion piece. This is published as a news article from the New York Times. So, uh, so it's a little bit different. Like the, the author of the news story editorializing their own opinions and conclusions in um, might be seen more towards the defamatory nature of the article because it's not labeled opinion. New York Times lawyer says the word deceptive is not actionable as libel because it is an opinion. Now, he says that, and that might be true, but deceptive might also not be true. You know, that'll be an argument that they'll have to have over the word deceptive and its context in regards to a news story or a news source. You know, if I just say, well, so-and-so over there is deceptive, maybe. But if I'm accusing a news publication of deceptive reporting, that's something a little bit different. That's something a little bit different. And uh, I, I do think at this point, New York Times probably has a good point about the deceptive thing. But uh, we'll see. Remember, it also depends on the overall gist of the publication, not just this one particular word. So the founder and CEO of Project Veritas announced today his journalism out outfit intends to sue the New York Times reporters, Maggie Astor, Tiffany Sue, and their paper for defamation after failed negotiations. So they have been trying to work this out. Uh, and we do have the full complaint uh, available, but we're not going to go through it on this video. Look for that in an upcoming video. We're not going to forget this, the transgressions against us, says James O'Keefe, 
who established Project Veritas in 2011 as a nonprofit company dedicated to investigative and undercover journalism. Several weeks ago, New York Times published two articles saying our Minnesota ballot harvesting investigation was deceptive. Times made false claims saying our story relied solely on unidentified sources. This is absolute hogwash, dishonest, and libelous. And I would agree with his assessment here. Um, unidentified sources is a statement of fact that is knowable. Very simple. You can just go to the video and see if there are unidentified or identified sources. So there you go. Taking, taking their assertion uh, as true, it, it is. They, are they identified or not? Project Veritas is suing the New York Times and we will win. O'Keefe said the legal action was filed at Westchester County Courthouse of Supreme Court of the state of New York. Lead counsel for this lawsuit is Libby Locke of, Clara Lo of Claire Locke. Locke successfully uh, litigated against the New York Times in the past, won a multi-million dollar judgment against Rolling Stone. Last year, she secured a $26 million defamation verdict in North Carolina. So they brought in a heavy hitter with a track record of success against news publications. Uh, it says the lawsuit is a watershed moment for Project Veritas and all other individuals and organizations. The old gray lady is unfairly attacked and marginalized. We're making our stand here and we are telling the Times and everyone else the lies stop now or we will fight you all the way to the Supreme Court, uh, quoting James O'Keefe. So I'm not going to go through this whole article. I encourage you to read it and check out their positions. Uh, it is big news. One thing I do want to um, talk about, one of the things they talk about in the article, which is interesting, and this adds uh, some complexity, but also some weight to their case, is that the uh, New York Times article relied on a Stanford um, a Stanford blog post about election integrity. And the blog post uh, allowed the New York Times to come to the conclusion that um, Project Veritas released their, uh, their, uh, their videos as part of a coordinated disinformation campaign based on timing and other things like that. Now, what they go on to argue in this article, which is actually a pretty interesting sort of point and argument, is that the New York Times piece was published 62 minutes after the Stanford blog post. Okay, so the Stanford blog post is about 1,200 words. So the, uh, the allegation would be that the New York Times reporter read a 1,200-word blog post, drafted a 1,000-word article citing the blog post, contacted the blog post for verification, also submitted the article to editors and published it in that 63-minute window or 62-minute window or whatever it was. That's a very, very fast response time. And so they allege that it kind of looks like they're involved in a disinformation style campaign under the the terms that the blog post itself lays out. Now, why is this important? This is important because part of a news story's uh, defense about the truthfulness of a matter will be whether or not it relied on some other source or if they came up with the allegations on their own. With the narrow window, with the narrow window between the publication of the blog post and the publication of the New York Times article, they are alleging that there was some coordination between the two publications, which if there was coordination between the two publications about this and they got Stanford to publish a thing so they could cite it for the purposes of then going after Project Veritas, that looks a little bit less like honest reporting and a whole lot more like some sort of deceptive practice. All right. So they're going to attempt to do that to allege that the reporting on the blog post is disingenuous and therefore feeds into the falsity of the article. Whether or not that'll be an effective strategy remains to be seen, but it's certainly an interesting approach and it eliminate or it mitigates one of the defenses that the New York Times is likely to use. Okay? So uh the the other part I want to talk about here is um this section right here. So this is from uh, the New York Times article. It says the video contains footage of a man identified as Liban Muhammad showing off ballots he says that he collected for Minneapolis City Council candidate 
something that, depending on the vid when the video was filmed, may not have been illegal. No, that's wrong. It was definitely illegal when the video was filmed. And if you film the video today, it's still illegal. Yeah, she goes on to say, because a district court judge in July temporarily suspended Minnesota's ban on third parties collecting and returning large numbers of completed ballots. Uh, Mr. Muhammad was not working for Ms. Omar. Uh, that is also not a correct legal assessment on the case. Uh, they did not suspend Minnesota's ban on third parties collecting and returning large numbers of completed ballots. They enjoined the Secretary of State from enforcing the ban that does exist. Uh, that that law has not been struck down by the courts. Now, the secretary of state was more than happy to not enforce this anyway. Uh, the secretary of state does not like this law, does not agree with it, um, was not uh, defending it in any way. Uh, Republicans have intervened. However, however, there is an injunction on the enforcement of this law throughout the election that does not make it illegal. That also means that when the act was done, the legal status of the act is the same. Just because they, that, and that's important, they've enjoined enforcement. They haven't struck, uh, the law is not stricken. They've not struck the law. They've just enjoined enforcement, which means it doesn't matter when you committed the act. They're enjoined from, enforce, or, uh, they're enjoined from enforcing the law against your action entirely. So that's uh, that's a weird sort of misstatement by the New York Times, but, you know, precision and all that. So anyway, I'll let you guys go ahead and read the rest of it. It is a very interesting read. We'll probably be covering this lawsuit very, very soon uh, as it develops. Um, I will say Project Veritas has a long road ahead of it. And one of the one of the other hurdles that I forgot to mention earlier is that of damages. It will be hard to tell how Project Veritas was specifically damaged in this case. Because unless they can show some sort of loss of reputation or profit uh, from this particular article, they won't be able to recover any monetary damages. However, they could get the court to order them to retract or something like that. But it remains to be seen. Um, ultimately, the motivation of many of these lawsuits, though the underlying legal matters may or may not have merit, uh, is to, is to make its own news story. So, and that's, I'm not accusing Project Veritas of doing that. I'm just saying that that is, that is a valid alternative use of the legal system. So long as your underlying case has merit. All right. And, uh, and the motivation for doing that, um, you know, is just to bring attention to the fact that maybe this other publication is, is dishonest from time to time and unfairly representing people uh, from a particular political perspective. So we'll watch it, see what happens. Uh, it'll be interesting for sure. Hope you found this educational and informative. Uh, check out the article in the link and have a good day. Peace. Peace.